and only mode. A very good day to those of you who are joining us. I'm pleased to inform you that we have over 450 participants from around the world listening in on today's Zeo Skin Health webinar. In an effort to better serve our physicians, professionals, and the public, Zeo will continue to host a series of educational webinars and seminars based on Dr. Zeno Baji's latest clinical findings and scientific thinking. For more information on upcoming events that are hosted by Zeo Skin Health, please visit the Zeo events page at zeoskinhealth.com. Before we begin, I have a few important points to bring to your attention. First, know that all participants are muted for the entire webinar. However, you may type questions into the webinar chat box and Dr. Eckel will answer as many of your questions as possible at the conclusion of her presentation. Lastly, a very important note, this webinar may not be copied, recorded, reproduced or distributed as this material is the intellectual property of Zeo Skin Health and Dr. Rachel Eckel. I'd now like to introduce you to Dr. Rachel Eckel, who will be presenting today's webinar. Dr. Eckel is an award-winning cosmetic dermatologist who completed her aesthetic medicine training with distinction at world-renowned institutions in both the United States and Europe, including Harvard and Oxford universities. Through her excellence, Dr. Eckel graduated top of her class and was awarded six revered first place medals for outstanding academic achievements. Twinned with her peerless charisma, this elite meld of bicontinental education has forged a preeminent leader in cosmetic medicine. Dr. Eckel is globally recognized as a key opinion leader and virtuoso in non-surgical facial rejuvenation. She remains actively involved in scientific audit, research, and the development of pioneering products and techniques. She has authored numerous medical journal publications and frequently contributes to consumer press, including Vogue, Harper's Bazaar, Cosmopolitan, Women's Health, Glamour, Elle, and Tatler. A regular speaker at leading international aesthetic conferences, Dr. Eckel is a draw at cutting-edge concepts in cosmetic dermatology. Dr. Eckel also lectures extensively worldwide to physicians and provides master class training with a focused interest in topical skincare agents. Dr. Eckel is closely mentored by Dr. Zeno Baji, who personally nominated her to lead his venerable Zeo Skin Health International Faculty. Through her distinguished success, Dr. Obaji also selected her to co-edit his latest book, The Art of Skin Health Restoration and Rejuvenation. The information in today's webinar is based on Dr. Obaji and Dr. Echo's clinical findings and expertise as practicing clinicians. Today's webinar topic is Vitamin A, the Superhero of Skin Care. A very good day. Good day, everyone, and thank you for tuning in from across the globe. My name is Dr. Rachel Eckel, and my presentation is titled Vitamin A, the Superhero of Skin Care. But what really is a superhero? Well, by definition, it's a character endowed with extraordinary abilities and usually portrayed as fighting evil. But let's apply that concept to skincare. Imagine all of the cells within the skin. We have the keratinocytes, the melanocytes, the fibroblasts, and also the angioblasts. Now let's think of their individual roles and all of the intricate interactions that occur daily between these structures. Now for fun, let's throw in a disease state and for spice pickle that with both extrinsic and intrinsic aging. The physiological scope now of cellular function and dysfunction becomes mesmerizing and extensive. Is it even possible for a single topical agent to target all of the cutaneous cells 
maximize and synchronize their functions while simultaneously reversing the evil that is disease and aging? Absolutely, and that's precisely why vitamin A gets my superhero mark of distinction. Now, most superheroes have a backstory, which will explain how they acquired their abilities. And vitamin A's began over 3,500 years ago in ancient Egypt. The recommended cure then for endemic night blindness was roasted ox liver, pressed and applied to the eye. And this was deemed particularly effective. But Egyptian medicine was partly empirical, partly magical, and it was really believed that this method transferred the remedy to the afflicted eye by way of the ox's super strength. But interestingly, the patient's sight did improve, but this contradicts what we know today in modern medicine. Vitamin A is only derived to the retina systemically, i.e. through the bloodstream. Hence, night blindness caused by a loss of rhodopsin in the retina would hardly yield to topical therapy, despite the juice of the ox liver being rich in vitamin A. But an amusing sidelight to this whole story and this mystical treatment that scholars later discovered is that the practitioners actually fed the remaining organs to the patients. But of course, this was never considered part of the Egyptians' night blindness magical therapy. But then during World War I, the role of dietary vitamin A was truly discovered, and it was known to maintain a number of mammalian functions, including xerosis and follicular hyperkeratosis. And then in around 1930, the chemical structure of retinol was documented. And by 1943, the first article using topical vitamin A to treat acne was published. But interestingly, it wasn't until 16 years later that this pioneer study became accepted and used in daily clinical practice. The year 1983 then marked another milestone for retinoids when Dr. Albert Klingman and his team demonstrated the role of retinoids in the man management of dermatoheliosis or sun damage. The authors observed that photo-aged mouse skin that was treated for approximately 10 weeks with vitamin A resulted in a significant repair zone of new collagen in the papillary dermis. Later ex vivo investigations were then carried out in 1996 by Fisher and his team, and these helped us to understand the molecular basis for the observation made by Klingman, but more so it was now understood how the vitamin performed intracellularly. This pioneer study showed us that upon entering cells, vitamin A can take its effect in two routes. Firstly, it can dock in the cytoplasm via the CRABP and CRBP receptors, and secondly, it can attach to the nuclear binding sites through the RXR and the RAR receptacles. So what does this exactly translate into in a clinical perspective? Well, we know now that vitamin A increases basal cell mitosis, which in turn thickens the epidermis and generates healthy keratinocytes. It also renews the exfoliation cycle that allows for an ethereal glow and a radiant appearance to the skin. It restores the natural moisturizing factor as well as repairing barrier function that leads to hydration and tolerance of the skin. It also decreases sebum production and this single-handedly in and of itself is going to give us a profound benefit on the skin by reducing inflammation, evening texture. Furthermore, vitamin A within the epidermis is going to reduce melanin content and also even the distribution of the melanin to surrounding keratinocytes, which in turn is going to lead to a more homogeneous color of the skin. Regarding the dermis, the benefits are also profound. Vitamin A is known to activate fibroblasts as well as Tg beta. That in turn leads to an upregulation of collagen and elastin that gives rise to textural smoothening. It's also been shown to suppress enzymes such as collagenase and matrix metalloproteinase, which too mean that we are going to retain the collagen and the elastin within the dermis to afford even greater textural smoothening and anti-aging benefit. Increased glycosaminoglycans means that we have more hydration within the dermis, but it also leads to increased wrinkle effacement, while suppression of the aging gene on chromosome 17 is going to allow us to retain youthfulness. 
Furthermore, vitamin A has been shown to enhance angiogenesis. This in turn leads to a rosy hue to the skin. It means that nutrients are delivered to the cells efficaciously and waste products are also removed in such a manner. But from a clinical perspective, what can we really do with this superhero vitamin? Well, a number of things. First of all, we can treat sebaceous gland disorders, and this includes things like acne, rosacea, and seborrheic dermatitis. Remember that seborrheic dermatitis is almost five times more common in patients who have rosacea and might be their initial presenting complaint. So don't forget to think about rosacea when a patient complains about this. We can also treat aging changes, both chronological as well as photo-age skin with vitamin A. Pigmentation disorders are also wonderful for us to improve with vitamin A. And I'm talking about things like melasma, post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation, ethylides, sun damage. And with vitamin A, I'm going to show you today how we can both treat, prevent, and maintain conditions of pigmentation safely and effectively long term. We can also ameliorate textural disorders, things like keratosis pilaris, acne scarring, large pores, sun damage. And lastly, we can also condition skin before procedures and make them less responsive to the ill effects of procedures by preconditioning for at least six weeks beforehand and six weeks afterwards with vitamin A. Interestingly, if we pre-treat skin before something like a, an ablative laser, we can reduce the downtime by between two and four days. It also leads to better wound healing due to the vitamin A's effect on circulation. But although vitamin A is a wondrous vitamin, it's not one that our body can actually synthesize. Vitamin A must therefore be supplemented in the form of retinal esters from animal sources and or beta carotene from plants. But when we ingest vitamin A, it is initially absorbed through the small intestine and then it is transported to the liver. In the liver, vitamin A is converted into retinol. Retinol then enters into the bloodstream and it reaches the target cells as retinol. Retinol then enters into the cell and inside the cell, retinol is bioconverted into retinoic acid, or if it's not needed then, it's stored as a retinal ester for later use. Therefore, the most important thing I want you to take away from the slide is that retinoic acid is an intracellular moiety, while retinol is the preferred extracellular form. However, irrespective of how much carrots we eat or how much vitamin A we ingest, it is preferentially distributed to the muscles, the brain, and the bones. Only a nominal amount ever reaches the skin from the oral route. Topical application is therefore paramount if we want to reap the cutaneous gains of this superhero vitamin. But what are the two chief forms of vitamin A that are commercially available? And, well, what's the difference? Well, we have retinoic acid and we also have retinol. So retinoic acid, when we apply this to the skin, it is the end form of the vitamin, the acid form that exists both extracellularly and intracellularly. Therefore, retinoic acid on application is going to generate a hearty amount of reactions, i.e. redness, dryness, and peeling, because acids are irritating to the skin and retinoic acid in this case is predominantly extracellular. On the other hand, if we apply retinol to the skin, it is the preferred state that the cells are accustomed to being presented with. When the retinol then enters into the cells, it is then converted into retinoic acid. So the irritating acid moiety stays inside the cells and doesn't cause redness, dryness, peeling, and the retinol is extracellular. Therefore, retinol is associated with much less reactions, usually two weeks of reactions, compared with retinoic acid that can cause reactions for as much as six to nine weeks. But going a step further, 
When we apply retinoic acid to the skin, it almost creates a cellular distasteful environment, and most of it stays outside of the cells. So very little retinoic acid actually enters into the cells because of this ferocious reaction environment. Retinol, on the other hand, when we apply it to the skin, it is the form that the cells prefer to be presented with, and therefore most of it is taken up intracellularly. Therefore, the nuclear benefits and therefore the effect on the DNA from retinol is far superior compared to retinoic acid. So much more intracellular benefit from retinol versus retinoic acid. And this is particularly important with regards to aging and anti-aging benefits. Now, retinol has a substantial benefit over retinoic acid when it comes to its anti-aging potential as a vitamin A derivative. We know the dermal delivery of retinol is better. 20% in one study, 20% of retinol was shown to be delivered to the dermis versus 2% of retinoic acid. This means that retinol's ability to upregulate collagen and elastin is much greater due to this increased dermal penetration. And as such, dermal changes can be histologically seen with retinol in as little as one week. Whereas with retinoic acid, studies have shown that it takes almost a year to see the dermal benefit. Patient compliance with retinol is also greater due to reduced reactions. This then in turn will lead to habitual daily application with a long-term cumulative benefit from the vitamin, as opposed to the usual start-stop regime that we see with retinoic acid. And this is particularly important when it comes to sensitive skin patients, which represent as much as 82% of the population, according to one German study. And while it's never too late to start availing of retinol's benefits, one landmark study from a group of nursing home patients with a mean age of 87 showed dramatic benefits, especially in relation to dermal stimulation after using retinol for just one week. So retinol versus retinoic acid really is the champion of anti-aging. Vitamin A also has unique benefits on melanocytes. We know that retinoic acid enhances keratinocyte shedding. That's because it decreases the contact, ta contact time between the keratinocyte and the melanocyte unit, thereby promoting a faster shedding of pigment. Retinol, like retinoic acid, promotes epidermopoiesis. However, in contrast, retinol has an additional blending capacity, meaning that retinol pushes existing pigment into neighboring keratinocytes, thereby improving skin tone and giving you a more homogenous, even tone. But there is yet another benefit of retinol over retinoic acid, and that's retinol's ability to prevent the onset of new pigmentation. Essentially, retinol does this by muzzling the keratinocytes, rendering them less reactive to negative stimuli, Things like heat, inflammation, UV radiation, hormonal fluctuations. Retinol's daily use in clinical practice for managing conditions of pigmentation is therefore expansive, especially as it is not associated with the long-term ill effects of hydroquinone. But the Vitamin A comic book has more than just retinoic acid and retinol as their featured characters. You would also have heard of retinaldehyde and retinal esters, which have recently entered the narrative. But why all of a sudden is there this surge in demand for vitamin A alternatives? It's because patients today are increasingly seeking non-invasive measures for anti-aging and skin rejuvenation purposes that have minimal downtime and are more cost-effective. Retinoic acid, although it is the protagonist of evidence-based medicine, is associated with a significant amount of downtime, i.e. six weeks of redness, dryness, peeling. Also, its anti-aging benefits, well, they take about a year to come around, and you need a prescription in order to obtain retinoic acid. That means that you have to attend a physician, pay for the physician's visit, and that means it gets very costly to use this derivative on a long-term basis. 
Furthermore, insurance plans do not cover anti-aging skincare, so people seek an alternative. That's why the derivatives such as retinol, retinaldehyde, retinol esters are becoming more favorable. Although they're, they're newer products and therefore they don't have as, as much evidence behind them, we do know that they cause much less downtime compared to retinoic acid, usually one to two weeks. Their benefit in anti-aging capacity is, is much larger compared to retinoic acid. We don't need a prescription for them, and therefore we don't have to pay for repeated doctor visits in order to obtain this vitamin A. So it's much more cost-effective and less burdensome on the patient's time. And they're therefore more likely to use it long-term. However, formulating an alternative to retinoic acid has for many, many decades proved tedious. Using retinol as an example, Previous formulations were malodorous, they were irritating in therapeutic doses, they were easily deactivated on exposure to sunlight and air, and it was very difficult to get them to be delivered to the deep dermal layers where we need them most. So with regard to the cost of vitamin A characters, what role do they each play today in clinical practice based on evidence-based medicine on Dr. Abaji's teachings? Well, let's start by having a look at retinoic acid. So retinoic acid we employ when we want to pack a strong punch, when we have a disease state, something like acne or rosacea or maybe melasma. We can also use it to condition the skin before procedure because we know that retinoic acid has wonderful wound healing capacities. It also reduces the potential for post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation and milia after procedure. However, it is associated with at least six weeks of redness, dryness, peeling as we build tolerance to the vitamin, and that's because of the exposed carboxyl group. Usually, we use retinoic acid for 18 weeks at a time cumulative, okay? And that's because 18 weeks equals three keratinocyte cell turnover cycles, one cycle being six weeks. And we know that based on the 30% rule of the skin, only about a third of the cells are awake at any one point. Therefore, if we want to rejuvenate the entire epidermis, we need three six-week skin cell turnover cycles, i.e. 18 weeks, to get the maximal epidermal benefit. Then after 18 weeks, we can move on to something else like retinol because we've had the maximal effects of retinoic acid. We know that if we want dermal remodeling, we have to wait a year, okay? So using retinol, retinoic acid, we, we keep it for just 18 weeks continuously and then we move on. It's finished its benefit. Beyond such time, beyond 18 weeks, if we use it continuously, we can start to see changes of chronic inflammation in the skin. A lot of patients are unable to build tolerance to the strong form of the vitamin and therefore remain red, dry and peeling long term, which is chronic inflammation, which we certainly don't want in our skin. Now let's have a look instead at retinol and her ability in the skin. So retinol is undoubtedly the most common and most fruitful over-the-counter variant of vitamin A that we see today. And that's because of stabilization advances that have been made in the chemical engineering and bio-vectoring of this product. It's also much more cost-effective but because we don't need a prescription in order to obtain retinol, but furthermore, it, because we've spent so much time researching and developing this formulation, we are able to employ retinol in formulations that is much more cost effective as opposed to something like retinaldehyde that can be quite costly. Now, the benefits of using retinol is that there are much less reactions generated compared to retinoic acid, usually just about two weeks of redness, dryness, peeling at most. And that's because the carboxyl group of the retinoic acid has been replaced with a hydroxyl group. We also know from the studies I've shown you that there is greater penetration of retinol into the dermis. So we see much better anti-aging capacity, much better benefit at improving collagen and elastin upregulation. Also, we know that it is safe and effective to use long term because retinol does not incite chronic inflammation if used after 18 weeks because cells are able to build tolerance and therefore become accustomed to this vitamin.
Therefore, the use of retinol is quite expansive. We can use it in clinical practice to treat, to prevent, to maintain, for anti-aging purposes, for conditions of pigmentation, either to treat, to stabilize, to blend. And also, it's a really important derivative when it comes to sensitive skin patients. Now let's have a look at retinaldehyde and their benefit according to evidence-based medicine in the skin. Now retinaldehyde is the intermediate compound formed when retinol is oxidized to retinoic acid. Now its appeal over retinol owes to a postulatory faster bioconversion to retinoic acid via this one-step process. However, this pathway is controversial. Many authorities instead debate that retinaldehyde, when you put it on the skin, instead converts primarily back to retinol by the enzyme retinol dehydrogenase. But irrespective of that, under varying microenvironments, other pathways can take effect over this theoretical primary. Now, clinical studies support these views because retinaldehyde superiority over retinol has not been scientifically qualified. We know that the linear dose response is lost with retinol concentrations in excess of 0.25 retinol or 0.5 retinaldehyde. Also, its efficacy in converting to the active form, i.e. retinoic acid, appears weaker in comparison to retinol. There are also many impediments when formulating a stable, cost-effective retinaldehyde product, and therefore over-the-counter availability remains very lean in 2015. So overall, retinaldehyde is an appealing vitamin A derivative in concept, but its role in current practice remains limited and controversial. And finally, let's have a chat about retinal esters. Now, retinal esters include retinal palmitate, retinal propionate, retinal acetate. These basically serve as a primary role in cellular storage of vitamin A. And retinal palmitate is the predominant form of storage. But for clinical activity, retinal esters must also undergo conversion to retinoic acid. And their development was prompted by the side effects of retinoic acid therapy and the initial instability of retinol. But sure, we've overcome that. However, no subjective or objective evidence exists today in support of their use over vehicle controls. But all the vitamin A characters have an innate kryptonite, which include moisturizers. Now, moisturizers, inert moisturizers or inert emollients are typically added to vitamin A compounds to reduce reactions. And these are usually inert molecules, but by adding them, we reduce the potential and the benefit of the vitamin A product. Also, some companies add steroids or some physicians will give a steroid cream in addition to the vitamin A molecule in order, again, to reduce reactions in favor of patient comfort. But we know that long-term steroid use leads to striate, telangiectasia, atrophy of the skin, so all negative effects. Basically, steroids are doing, and moisturizers are doing the exact opposite of what vitamin A is doing. Okay, so they really are the, 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 the um, kryptonite of the vitamin A. But remember as well that vitamin A is a very, very unstable molecule. It is easily degraded in response to oxygen, light, heat, humidity, and lipid peroxidation. Therefore, we have to be very careful when we formulate this product to make sure that it maintains its stability. So when we're choosing a vitamin A topical, you want to choose one that is in an airtight container, in a UV protective system, and also delivered by pump dispensing. That means that you can quantify the exact dosage of the vitamin A that you need according to the area that you're applying it to. Now to overcome their foes, superheroes are equipped with an arsenal of weapons. And similarly, Clinicians have Zeo Skin Health to tackle cutaneous nemeses. Now, this prescription grade skincare line offers a comprehensive portfolio of efficacious vitamin A products. This includes over six retinol topicals and two retinoic acid products. 
That means with this comprehensive portfolio, we are able to treat, prevent, maintain a wide variety of ages and patients who enter into our clinic, irrespective of age, gender, ethnicity, or complaint. But the zero retinol products all have a multimodal benefit platform, meaning that if a product is created to remedy a problem, we're not just going to shoot one bullet at it. Instead, we're going to empty all chambers. We employ multiple mechanisms of action so as to maximize the cutaneous gains from the retinol. We're not just going to put a high concentration of potent, beautiful retinol in an emollient base. That would be like putting a foot, pair of foot pedals in the ferocious Batmobile and expecting the Batmobile to perform at the same high level. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to build a base to support and maximize the retinol's potential by adding things like anti-inflammatory complexes, physiologically relevant lipids for barrier restoration, DNA repair enzymes and their precursors, multiple antioxidants working in synergy, biomimetic technology, and these are all encapsulated in unique delivery systems for epidermal and or dermal benefit. But the retinol concentration and packaging is just as important. Using retinol as an example, we know that scientifically researched beneficial concentrations range for point, from 0.4 to 1%. We also know that from Klingman's initial research studies, he advocated that we need at least 0.6% in the skin in order to see any benefits. The average over-the-counter product contains 0.08% of retinol or less. So the concentration of retinol is really important. And in Zio, for example, one of the products that we have, Radical Night Repair, is a whopping 1% retinol. Furthermore, this is in an airtight pumped delivery system that is UV protected. Most of these drugstore and department store products come in a jar that is opaque. But as soon as you open the jar, the retinol is the ineffective concentration of retinol becomes deactivated because it is exposed to sunlight and air, which in turn means you have retinol that just doesn't work on the skin. So let's have a closer look into the vitamin A products available to us through Zio, starting with Growth Factor Serum. So Growth Factor Serum is a gentle approach to retinol. This is a low dose of retinol that we can use, say, if we have a young patient that comes into the practice in the early 20s, the early 30s, maybe even somebody who's in the social limelight, who doesn't want any redness, dryness peeling due to the retinol concentration, but still wants the benefit of vitamin A. You can also use this for patients with sensitive skin. It's a nice product while you have on your training wheels and you're getting accustomed to retinol. It's a nice product to start off with and then you can graduate to more moderate or aggressive forms of the vitamin as the skin builds tolerance. Now within the growth factor serum, we of course, we have a low dose of retinol that's not going to incite any redness, dryness peeling. But there's other things, things like antioxidants, amino acid building block, protein building blocks, as well as biomimetic proteins. And DAGP is a marvelous example of a biomimetic protein that is used concomitantly with retinol. So N-acetyl glucosamine 6-phosphate, or NAG6P, is this innate messenger that encodes for glycosaminoglycan production. But it doesn't really biodeliver because it doesn't have solubility properties. Now, this technology came out of France. And basically, we attach a disodium moiety onto the end that makes it water soluble. So we have disodium acetyl glucosamine phosphate. So this is going to permeate through the skin when it sees the high resident water content. Now, once this has penetrated the epidermis, Water pulls the disodium off, so you're basically left with AGP, which functions the same as NAGP. The disodium was just giving it the solubility property to enter into the cell. But now when you pull off the disodium, the molecule goes a little crazy and electrons reorientate themselves to stabilize. And all 6 means, 6P means, is how the electrons are orbiting. It then penetrates down into the dermis, and once it reaches this layer, NAGP, can boost GAG production or glycosaminoglycan production by 84% in as little as 10 days. That's massive. 
And this is an escalating curve that's almost linear, meaning that we get a continual progression of 84%. So we get this immediate onset of benefit and the accumulation of the benefits. And that's just one of the additives in the growth factor serum. Now here we see a patient, young patient, who doesn't need a high dose of retinol. She just needs a low dose of retinol to maintain cellular activity. She's used growth factor serum, and we can see all of the benefits in the skin after six weeks. Now, let's move on to radical night repair. Again, this is a retinol product available to us in the Zeo Skin Health portfolio. Now, radical night repair is a bit more moderate of an approach using 1% retinol. Now this 1% retinol is in an oleosome delivery system, okay? It is also an anhydrous system, meaning that it's going to drizzle the effects of the retinol slowly into the epidermis and the dermis. That means that the reactions, the redness, dryness, peeling from radical night repair are going to be less and you're going to get a really slow delivery of this into the epidermis and then the dermis. Radical night repair is going to give you a holistic approach at anti-aging and cellular rejuvenation from retinol. You can also use radical night repair to do something like a five-day atom peel. Now here we see a patient with seborrhea. We see oily skin. We see large pores. We see also ethylides. She's been treated with Zeo Medical. She's used Radical Night Repair. And this is her after 12 weeks. So we can see all of those wonderful benefits of vitamin A to the skin. Now I also mentioned that you can use Radical Night Repair to pack a strong punch into the regime by supplementing in a five-day atom peel, meaning that for five days you take a more minimalistic program, irrespective of what topicals you're on. You, 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 you take to a very minimalistic program where you have a cleanser, daily power defense, radical night repair that you're applying morning and night, as well as sunscreen, for anywhere between three and five days. And that is to increase the benefits of vitamin A and give you a, a, a nice atom peel. So here we see a patient with rosacea who was treated with radical night repair, and she also had a five-day atom peel using radical night repair, eight pumps in the morning, eight pumps at night. The next product that I'm going to detail is called Retamax. So Retamax is again a moderate approach to employing retinol in a topical formulation. This is 0.5% retinol, but don't be confused by the percentage. This is a microemulsion system of Retamax, meaning that it's an oil and water emulsion. In essence, there's an oil phase or a lipidic phase that is emulsified in a continuous phase of water. And when we take this out and we put it under the microscope, we can see a bunch of little fish eyes. And that's basically the emulsified oil droplet inside of a water medium. Retamax, in contrast to radical night repair, is a microemulsion. Radical night repair is a macroemulsion. This means that Retamax is going to quickly penetrate through the epidermis, bypass the epidermis, and carpet bomb the dermis with that 0.5% retinol. So all of it is biovectored onto the dermis. And that is specifically so that we can improve the texture and we can get more dermal benefit from Retamax. So Retamax benefit is really dermal. Yes, we get some epidermal benefit because of course some men will be lost to the epidermis on its way down, but it's mainly dermal. So things like scars, large pores. Men typically have very large pores, rough texture to their skin. So this is a, a wonderful choice in that category of patients. Also, you can use it on the body, on the thick skin on the body, things like keratosis pilaris on the upper arms or on the thighs. Here we see a patient with severe photoaging, so elastosis, ethylides, and she's been treated with, with uh, Zeo Retamax, and we can see a significant improvement, not only in the color of the skin, the, the homogeneity of, of the skin, but also of the texture. And she's shown here before and after being treated with Retamax for 12 weeks. But we can also treat scars with Retamax. Here we see a periareolar scar after a patient had a breast augmentation that has been treated with Retamax for five months. So again, 
Retamax's primary benefit from a topical perspective is to upregulate dermal production of collagen, elastin. It's wonderful a textural repair. The next product that we'll speak about is Brightenex. Now, Brightenex, again, like Radical Night Repair, like Retamax, is a moderate approach to delivering retinol to the skin. Now, we have two different options with Brightenex. We have either 1% retinol or 0.5% retinol. And I'll get to the reason behind this in a minute. But Brightenex is basically retinol that is encapsulated in an oleosome delivery system. This means that the retinol is going to be biovectored to surgically strike the melanocyte. So Brightenex is made for the melanocyte unit in order to both prevent and correct the onset of pigmentation. Now, the reason why we have the 1% and the 0.5% retinol is that you could start off with the 1% with a patient to treat, and then for maintenance, you can bump them down to the 0.5% retinol. Now, you might think, well, why would I use retinol to treat pigmentation when I have something like hydroquinone or ascorbic acid? But if you think about it, retinoids are really the preeminent leader when it comes to treating and maintaining and managing pigmentation conditions. Now, let's think about it. If we have a hierarchy of products, if we think about hydroquinone, hydroquinone as a topical for treating pigmentation is about a 10 out of 10. It's very effective, but it, it's a double-edged sword. It has benefits, but it also has negative effects. Retinoids, on the other hand, give you about a 7, 7.5 to 9.5 benefit on the scale, depending on the concentration, and if you use morning and night, whereas ascorbic acid or vitamin C is about a 5, and alpha or butin, well, that's around a 4.5, 4, okay? But the beauty of retinoids is that you don't get any rebound hyperpigmentation like hydroquinone. You don't get any free photo damage. There is no onchronosis associated with retinoids. And you don't get an unnatural bleaching of the skin that you see when darker skin patients use hydroquinone. Now, think of melanogenesis as a ladder. And what we're basically trying to do with Brightenex, our retinol formulation for melanocytes, is we're trying to break the rungs in this melanogenesis ladder. Now, the first thing to trigger the melanocyte is an inflammatory messenger, such as UV radiation or heat. So in the Brightenex, we, can, we notice that it's a really sophisticated product with many different ingredients in it in order to maximize the retinol's potential. We have Stasius officinalis, the functional compound of which is 10% acetoside. This is going to form complexes with biochemical messengers to stop the inflammatory cascade. So it's going to prevent the onset of new pigmentation, which is quite difficult. We also add in soy isoflavones that particularly block the PAR2, specifically responsible in chrome conversion. And acetyl glucosamine and glutathione are two different blockers that work with the tyrosinase enzyme level. We also have secondary and tertiary antioxidants that are supplemented to reduce reactive oxygen species, which in turn kick on the inflammatory response and then melanogenesis. So again, a really comprehensive retinol product that is specific for treating and managing and preventing conditions of pigmentation. Now we can use Brightenex for both medical as well as non-medical conditions. You can use it to treat melasma, maintain melasma. You can also use it for something like sun damage. There's a vast array of what we can do with it from a clinical perspective. We can prevent, we can correct, we can maintain, we can follow on from hydroquinone with Brightenex. We can also use it if the patient has a hydroquinone allergy. It's wonderful to use in darker skin patients. And usually in these patients, I will only ever use hydroquinone for about six weeks. I'm talking about melamine, okay? And then I will transition them onto Brightenex so as not to unnaturally bleach their skin. It's also a good option for patients who are chronically exposed to the sun, such as us down here in the West Indies, because we know that sun is going to give you photo damage. And if you use something like hydroquinone on a long-term basis and you take away the, the melanin production, then you're going to be more susceptible to sun damage and have more dermatoheliosis. But remember, whenever you transition from hydroquinone onto Brightenex, 
you want to cycle down gradually from the hydroquinone while you introduce the brightenex so as not to have any rebound hyperpigmentation occurring. Now, although we think of superheroes, we think of them predominantly as being nocturnal creatures, vitamin A can also perform its duties in the daytime. And yes, brightenex can be used in the daytime, as can all of our vitamin A products. One study showed that on exposure to light, retinol stability only marginally decreased and this was a gradual process with as much as 91% of the retinol remaining stable after four hours of application in the daytime. So yes, this is a commonly asked question. You can use vitamin D in the daytime, in the nighttime. It is susceptible to light and air degradation. However, this is marginal with our products and it's also a very gradual process. Now here we see a patient with FLED. She also has a family history, a long-standing family history of pseudocutus laxa. She has been treated with um, Brightonix for a period of six weeks, twice weekly application over the period of six weeks. Here's another patient who suffered with post-inflammatory hyper and hypopigmentation secondary to laser misuse. She also has seborrhea and mild rosacea treated the zeomedical way with Brightonix, and this is her after 12 weeks of topical treatment. So we see here, this is a good example to show you the blending capacity of Brightonix, of retinol. It is, it is a potent blender, and we know that retinoic acid does not give us that benefit unless, say, it's mixed with something like Melmix. Now the next product we're going to speak about is a body specific product and it's called Brightamax. Now Brightamax again is a moderate approach to retinol. Now Brightamax specifically is for the body. It's a non-facial, non-hydroquinone skin brightener and it's 0.25% retinol delivered in a multimodal benefit platform. Now the ingredients in Brightamax very much sort of resembles Brightamax but it's not as powerful as Brightonex because it doesn't have that, that high concentration of retinol. And that's for a specific reason, because the Brightamax was specifically formulated so that we could effectively treat the more sensitive areas of the skin, like in the axilla, in the inguinal fold regions, areas that have thin skin that rub against each other. There's a lot of heat, there's a lot of sweat, there's a lot of sebum, and therefore these places are very susceptible. If you over-irritate them with a high concentration retinoid, you will end up with something like this, which is interrigo. So the last thing we want when a patient comes in with uh, auxiliary hyperpigmentation is to give them a really high concentration of retinol used two, three times a day, and then they end up with something like this. So we want to avoid this. So that's why we specifically created Brightamax so that we could effectively treat these delicate regions without running into problems such as interigo. And don't forget when you have interigo, bacteria and fungi love it. They love a really wet, moist environment, the swampy area, and so you can get a secondary or a tertiary infection. So we want to prevent this from happening, and that's precisely why we created this product specifically for these sensitive areas of the body. Now, Brightamax, again, non-hydroquinone skin brightener, we can use to both correct and prevent the onset of new pigmentation. Now, yes, this is a more gentle approach than, say, something like Brightonex, but you can also bolster this as the skin becomes more tolerant. For example, the back of the hands is a really thin, delicate region that you wash the hands many times a day, so there's a lot of irritation. You could do Bright Max once or twice a day. You could also supplement Bright Alive at night with it and or something like Sea Bright. This is a small surface area. If you want to do something more moderate, say like the decolletage region, that's a very thin skin area as well, you could do Brightamax twice, three times weekly, and on the other days, supplement something like Brightamax once a day. And then you could even make it even more aggressive by adding something like Retamax two, three times a week. And then you can gradually increase the, the application of these topicals according to the skin's response. Now, of note, you can add Invisapeel into any regime in order to get more deeper dermal benefits. So you could use Brightamax on its own morning and night 
And then you could add, say, Invisipeel onto that maybe two, three times a week at a night time. And that will give you more deeper dermal, more profound benefit from the Brightamax. Now, here we see an area of skin that is very delicate. This is the intergluteal cleft. And this is a patient who suffered with psoriasis in this region and, and would get very irritated. And she had used um, hydroquinone in the past in order to help with the post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. But this she found very irritating in the area and it would incite the psoriasis to return. And instead, we treated her with, with a low concentration of retinol. And we can see a really beautiful improvement in as little as six weeks. Now, this is a decolletage region. This is classic sun damage with ethylides. Again, this is a thin skin area of, of the body. And so we have to be very gentle when we, when, when we uh, correct it because we don't want to drive the patient crazy with reactions and itching. So with this patient, we did body emulsion twice a day. We did bright max morning and night, most days of the week, and then gradually increased the brightenex nighttime, 0.1% brightenex starting off at twice a week and then increasing gradually and supplementing then Retamax in once or twice a week and again increasing gradually. And don't forget, the last thing you always finish on the body with is sunscreen, something like the, the Zeo body spray. Now I put this slide in purposely to remind you that when you're treating the body, you must be mindful of the amount of product that you apply. You wanna know that you're applying the correct dose according to the surface area being treated. And that's why it's important to understand and have this chart in your office as clinicians to be able to advise patients as to what, um, how, what amount of pumps they're supposed to be applying of these products onto the skin. So we know from the plastic surgery burns percentile chart that the face occupies 5% body surface area and something like the decolletage would be 10% body surface area. So you would apply twice the amount of product on the decolletage as you would in comparison to the face. Now, lastly, I know this is not a, a vitamin A topical independently on its own, but I thought it relevant to include it. And that is the retinol cream that forms the second step in the three-step peel. Now, what's quite interesting about Dr. Obagi's peels is that although he's doing an epidermal peel, like the three-step peel, he's also achieving dermal stimulation. You're also getting dermal upregulation of collagen and elastin, and that's because he couples his peel solution with a high concentration of retinol straight after he applies the acids. So in this case, in the case of the three-step peel, we have 6% retinol cream. Now, this retinol is fairly similar to radical night repair, meaning that it's a macroemulsion. So it's going to give you that nice, slow delivery through the epidermis and into the dermis, but it's a whopping 6%. And you have nighttime application and the following morning application, two applications after you've had the in-office peel solution applied to the face. And we see a patient pre-treated with Brightonex, and then she's had one three-step Zeo peel. Quite significant improvement. Now, the last category of vitamin A that I'm going to touch upon is retinoic acid. Now, retinoic acid, we know we can have, find in, in many different types of topical formulations. You have gel formulations, which can be quite irritating and only give you epidermal benefit. You have microspheres and lotions that can be quite weak as well. And then you have cream formulations, which are ideal. And when you're using a cream formulation, we know that you want about one to two fingertip units. You want about an inch of toothpaste, okay? So that's the, the tip of the baby finger, a nice thick amount of retinoic acid. Again, these typically come in tubes. They're not in pump dispense systems, and therefore you must be able to measure it out and, and be able to advise your patients accordingly. Now, within Zeo, we have two different concentrations of retinoic acid that you can use. You have 0.5% and 0.1% retinoic acid. Now, Alfred Klingwan, who was the father of vitamin A, would always advocate the high strength of using retinoic acid because this was associated with a faster improvement of the patient. They had quicker retinization. They also had greater compliance and satisfaction. Remember that this is a drug with delayed gratification and local side effects. So you want them to come around more quickly. In fact, some of his studies use concentrations as high as 1% retinoic acid and patients had huge tolerance and compliance and 
faster retinization with the 1% as opposed to lower concentrations. Now the 0.05% I would typically reserve for patients who have dry or sensitive skin or during pulse maintenance programs or if say a patient has a recalcitrant uh, disease. Now within Zeo, we mix the retinoic acid with Melamix and there is a particular numerous benefits for this. That's because Melamix acts as a penetration enhancer, meaning that it enhances the, the, the delivery of the tretinoin or the retinoic acid into the cells. It also affords blending of melamine. So it allows the retinoic acid to act a little bit more like retinol and give us more of a blending capacity, i.e. push pigment into the surrounding keratinocytes. It also contains a blend of exfoliants, which will help to purge pigment at a faster rate. So we see quicker benefit onset realization. And it also has strategic barrier repair ingredients, i.e. physiologically relevant lipid fractions to mitigate the, the barrier, um, the barrier uh, damage that is occurring while we're using the, the, the retinoic acid. So these two products we always use together. Here we see a patient with early rosacea and photo damage treated with retinoic acid and melamix. And this is after being treated for 18 weeks. Again, this is a patient with active rosacea as well as she's Celtic skin and this is classic ethylides. She's been treated with retinoic acid and melamix. Now notice we're choosing retinoic acid in these cases because the patient has active disease. And when we want to go in and we want to pack a strong punch, that's when we choose retinoic acid. And we always mix the retinoic acid with melamix because it gives us more profound, significant benefits because it acts as a penetration enhancer, amongst other things. Now, it's interesting that when you start to tell clients for the first time about vitamin A and you tell them that I'm going to give you a topical that causes a bit of redness, dryness, peeling, they sort of look at you as if you have two heads because most of our consumers are accustomed to using things like moisturizers that are very comforting and gratifying. And this sort of defies all the rules when you tell them that it's associated with reactions. But it's really important to counsel patients about reactions so that they don't fare what's to come and so that they understand it and therefore they will comply with the treatment regime that you suggest. So that we, we know that when we treat, say for example, with retinoic acid, there will be an 18-week treatment program. The first six weeks you have reactions, redness, dryness, and peeling, but the more you use the product is the more the skin builds tolerance and the more it becomes more healthy and it repairs itself. And then we go into the comfort phase. So there's much less reactions in the second six weeks of topical application. And then by the last six weeks, we have healthy skin with no more reactions. And then we can move on to something like retinol. Now, reactions tend to look like this. You can have either very flaky skin or very red skin or both. So this is a good example of redness, dryness, and peeling. And you should have your own photos on file that you can show your patients so that they know exactly what to expect when they're using this vitamin so that they know that this is a normal sign. According to Dr. Baji, when you see redness, dryness, peeling from your vitamin A, you should say hallelujah because you know it's working. You know you're going to have a really good effect at the end. It's doing its job. Now, interestingly, reactions tend to occur most around the eyes and around the mouth. And that's because of the muscular action in this area. Around the eyes, you have the orbicularis oculi, and around the mouth, you have the orbicularis oris. And the more muscular activity or the more expression that you have in an area of skin is the more that you're going to have redness, dryness, and peeling. And that's why vitamin A reactions tend to be most pronounced around the eyes and around the mouth. And I thought it was interesting to include this photo of a clown because clowns typically tend to highlight the areas of the most expression and muscular activity on their face, which is around the eyes and around the mouth. However, when a patient comes into your practice and you're telling them about vitamin A, you need to reassure them and teach them how to use this vitamin A, at least initially while they're building tolerance to its use. So you don't want your patient too comfortable or too uncomfortable. You want them in this nice, sweet spot in the middle. Therefore, if they're too comfortable, it means there's no reactions. It means that they're probably not applying the topical of vitamin A often enough. So they need to increase the application of the vitamin A product. 
However, if they're very uncomfortable, if they're red, dry, cracking, they don't want to eat, they're complaining a lot, they don't want to go to work, then that's a, that's an area that we don't want them in. So then they need to reduce the application of the vitamin A topical so that they get back to that sweet spot in the middle. Now, another useful tool that we have within Zero is our anti-inflammatory calming agents. These are to go side by side with your vitamin A topicals. They provide soothing, calming, anti-redness, anti-irritation to the skin. We have three different formulations available to us with different levels of occlusivity and, and hydration benefits that you can add into your patient's program. Say, for example, daily renewal cream. If you're living, let's just say, in the UK and where you have four different seasons, daily renewal cream you might give to patients during the summertime or something more occlusive you might give to them if they are going through, say, say a winter or you have them on um, concomitant isotretinoin use. You may give them something more occlusive like Restore Calm to help soothe, calm, and settle the skin. Now, these are there to hold your patient's hands when they're going through reactions, when they're red, dry, and peeling. They will cool, they will calm the skin, but they will not depend on them throughout the rest of their life as they're using vitamin A. It will only be used during the first couple of weeks when the skin is building tolerance to the vitamin, and after such time, they can then wean the application off. Now, strategically, What's nice about these calming and hydrating agents is that it's not just an inert emollient that we're applying to the skin. Instead, it is sophisticated products that are chemically engineered to both repair the water lipid protein balance in the epidermis while also upregulation glycosaminoglycan and hyaluronic acid production within the dermis. So essentially, we're making the dermis really nice and wet and soggy with all of these ingredients. And then we're locking in the water with an intact epidermis through the correct balance of water lipid protein so that it can't evaporate out. So we're basically targeting dryness and irritation from the cellular level, from the epidermis as well as the dermis with our topical agents. Now, vitamin A's benefit is wonderful, but it's hampered if you use it independently. And that's why Zeo's Fundamental 5 form the foundation upon which we build the vitamin A. So our mantra of wash, scrub, oil control, daily party fence and sunscreen is very important to have as your foundation upon which you build the vitamin A. Specifically, using an example, getting skin ready is going to remove your debris. It's going to get rid of the sebum, your impurities, and it's also going to remove dead cornea sites. This means that there will be a clean canvas upon which vitamin A can work and therefore penetrate the skin effortlessly. But vitamin A has also been shown to perform better when skin is hydrated. And that's where the benefit of daily power defense comes into effect with its physiologically relevant lipid fractions. And whether using vitamin A or not, sunscreen is always indispensable. But it is particularly important to couple the first two weeks of the vitamins use with UV protection because during this time, the skin is sensitive to sunlight. But this is not unique only to vitamin A. It pertains to all exfoliants, including something as gentle as a scrub. So to conclude, although we have a comprehensive array of efficacious vitamin A products in our Zio portfolio, just as important is our medical director. He is the penultimate superhero of skincare for over three decades, Dr. Zain Obaji. So thank you for your time. I'm now going to answer a couple of questions that have come in through the chat box. So the first question that we have is, Dr. Eckel, can we use vitamin A during pregnancy? So vitamin A is not to be used topically during pregnancy. Even orally, many gynecologists, OBGYNs, will suggest that while a patient is pregnant, that they also limit their ingestion of vitamin A-rich foods, things like the liver, for example, or carrots. So we know that the vitamin A has ill effects on a fetus while it's developing. And therefore, scientific evidence shows us definitely not to use retinoic acid or retinol during the pregnancy period. Can you tell me how to transition from hydroquinone 
to brighten X. So when a patient is using hydroquinone, let's say a dark skin patient, because this can be a, quite a, a tricky or onerous category. So if you have a dark skin patient who is using hydroquinone, melamine, melamix, and retinoic acid, Uh -oh. Sorry. So if you have a dark skin patient who is using melamine, melamix, and retinoic acid to treat something like melasma, for example, then they would use these products initially, and around six weeks, you would want to taper down the melamine. It's, or, or around the time when you start to see that, that you're, you're addressing the melasma and that the pigmentation is improving, you'd want to taper down the amount of melamine that you're applying to the patient's skin and instead start to introduce something like Brightonex. So you might do melamine three days a week and Brightonex the other days. And then what you would want to do is you would continue with the melamix and retinoic acid for up to 18 weeks because we know that's not going to lighten the condition of the darker skin patients. That's only going to help to blend. It's the melamin that lightens the skin. So melamin is, is the bleaching agent. So we pull this back around six weeks. We introduce the Brightonex into the regime slowly for the first um, six weeks or so. And then we fully get rid of the melamin and we have the Brightonex being used every day. We continue with the retinoic acid and melamix up to 18 weeks. And then after 18 weeks, we then can transition onto something like Retimax. So the patient after using the hydroquinone would be on something like Brightonex in the morning and Retimax in the evening. And during maintenance, you can then um, you can then supplement that with something like a three three step peel to help to offload excess pigmentation, or a series of five day atom peels. So this now concludes today's webinar. Thank you for your attendance.